so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like an anti-self-help book. That's the idea. Uh, the first chapter is called Failure. It's a uh, <laughs> Larkin. So it's uh, it's all anyway. So stop on. Uh, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Janet for um, asking me. Um, and a pleasure to be in the so what about any Burgess's furniture? Uh, I don't know why. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm sad that the issue couldn't come, but I, we, I have to read for an extra five minutes, so I'm going to read three shortish poems, and I'll read that um, the, the longish poem that um, Simon mentioned up here. So, it's, I, it's very hard to listen to such beautiful live music and then move to poetry. I always feel a bit mesmerized after hearing particularly the cello, weirdly, that was just wonderful. Um, but I've been moving from the sublime to the ridiculous. Um, this is a poem called The Ideen. Two kinds of people in the world, those who've seen a magpie kill a baby rabbit, and those who haven't. I, I, I'm in the first group. This poem is about that. The Ideen. The magpie reasserts its stance with the testy flap of black on white a flash of blue, and a stone might do but doesn't, so I have to shoo it off with a folded tartan picnic blanket, and the baby rabbit, what is left of it, keeps screaming. And it happens that your options narrow sometimes drastically, and what you might do if the kids were not here is walk to the car and get in it and leave, turning up the radio. But they want to know now what one does with enormous pain when you see it, where you should put it. Why might you stop it when they're watching, when the rabbit is done, past saving? So I lift the stone again and the bird hops off as I walk across and looks on with interest. And if at first I miss it, the second time smashes in the socket of the rabbit's eye, the one the magpies already emptied out to a plush red nest, a divot of flesh. I'm in the driver's seat and breathing and need to drink some water. I can overhear it screaming in the silence that fills the car on the drive back to a house that is a little different, harder, sharper, and where my children will not look at me. I read an elegy for a friend of mine called Martino. Um, Slavi, who died uh, a couple of years ago of a brain. Ben Schumer, uh, I knew Martino um, from, from London, actually I'm from Cambridge. Um, he was always at the sort of the edge of the group wearing something outrageous, like a Paisley cape or something, and he was a astonishing looking guy. One of those guys whose head sort of starts here and it goes straight all the way down to the tip of his nose, which is just a flat thing. Um, a beautiful, interesting face, kind of like an Easter Island head. Um, and then I moved to Rome um, for a few years and he, he was living there, he, he was from Siena. So we got friendly and this poem is about him. We used to hang out in a place called Monte in Rome, which is where I lived and where he lived. And there's a statue in a church there of Michael, by Michelangelo, of Moses. Um, it's in a church called San Pietro in Binkley, which is St. Peter and James. And this statue of Moses has two horns coming out of his head. Um, they don't know why, they think it's a sort of mistranslation, and there's a word for blessed, I think, and it looks a bit like horns. So anyway, Michelangelo made him have horns. It's an amazing um, statue. Attention. Attention is a single white marble, translucent with a turquoise wave breaking within it. Attention. Is that marble bouncing wildly down the alley and reaching the top of the steps by the bar I met you at Monday, Martino? To sit out the evenings drinking in those steps? Were all the treads abowed in the middle by millennia of pilgrims heading up to San Pietro in Vincoli to seek forgiveness? To bow their heads? To ask some questions of themselves in a place attention is a single block of white Carrara marble carved by Michelangelo into the statue of Moses we stood before, stoned, wondering why he horns. An attention to the style of things is an attribute worn, Martino, by you around Hoxton on his statue like a purple boiler suit, which you also wore. An attention is that single white marble now descending the stone steps by the bar, rolling along the depth of one tread and dropping, then rolling the depth of another and dropping, and the next, 
dropping and rolling, dropping and rolling, not silently, until the single white marble, translucent with a turquoise wave, hits the pavement and skitters onto the cobbles to wedge, pearl like, beneath the tire of a Vespa. Latino, it is evening and raining in London, and I am making tea, and we don't say that we both know it is the last time we will meet. Your face is swollen from the treatment, and your head fantastically stitched together as you sit on the edge of the sofa, all attention, all wrapped in chains of attention. Evinkley can be translated as constraints, bonds, ties, links, or limits, obligations. The chains of St. Peter, the rock of the church, sit in a mother of pearl box. Freud walked past to stand before the Moses statue he rises, seated. His body faces forward. His head, with its mighty beard, looks to the left. His right foot rests on the ground, and his left leg is raised so that only the toes touch the ground. What the statue says to me is that Moses can barely stop himself, that he almost cannot bear it. Is on the verge of rising and allowing something overwhelming, rage, I think, free reign. And impatiently he stares down tourists, strips in past, outfacing them as he outfaced Freud. He came every afternoon for weeks to try to disentangle the piece's emotional effect. Attention from the Latin ad tendere, to stretch towards, to try to meet. And Tino, in your brain, the tumour spreads so fast that it has taken the shape and the scan of a finch, a finch in flight, and has pecked away your mind to such an extent you can write still but no longer read. And as you sit in the kitchen attending, attending, all bound up in these chains of attention, all charged with a terrible, helpless attention, I want to tell you Michelangelo is reputed to have loved the statue so much he held his hammer at it and cried that it would not speak. To bend inward forever, shine from the world and retrace the first curve but at a greater distance, letting the correct inflection delineate an absence with just sufficient tension to hold the poems together. Finish with that long poem up late. It's in separate parts. I don't know how to make that noise for the asterisk, so I just lift my hand between them. Up late. If I shut my eyes to the new dark, I find that I start to experience time in its purest sleep. A series of durations rising and dilating beneath my inward gaze. An eruptive core where the umbra blooms and crestless waves of darkness is within. Another umbra bubbles up from the interior, from nothingness, from nowhere. And at the centre of the crest of this disintegrating, reassembling nest, the jet of time generates its consciousness, the planetary mind, aloft, alone, <coughs> mind, jostled and spun like a ping pong ball. My father died today. Sorry to bolt that on. Do you understand the shift required? This morning the consultant said, Your father now is clawing at the mask and is exhausted, and we've thrown everything we have at this. It's a terrible disease. He promises to give him morphine and that a nurse will be beside him at all times to hold his hand and talk him through it. It being the transition, the change of state, the fall of light, the trade. The instant of the hand itself turning from the subject into the object. No, we are not allowed in the war, and there cannot be exceptions. Thank you for making this difficult call. But I know what the body wants. Continuance. Continuance. Continuance at any cost. But dying then, as we speak, my father in the IC ward of Andrew Area Hospital. The IC ward. The ICU. I see you too. On Sunday they permitted us to Zoom. He was prone in a hospital gown, strapped to a white slab. A hospital gown split at the back, and the pale cold skin of his back was exposed. 
lifted his head to the camera and his face was dark red and puffy bisected vertically by the mask and we had to ask Elizabeth the nurse to say his words back to us. He sounded on the water. It's been a busy day, but not a good day. I could see even with the mask on, your little satisfaction with the phrase managed out. And the achievement left you so depleted you lowered your head back to the slab, having done with us. Like some seal on a rock looking up as we pass on the Blue Pool ferry out to Garnish. Dad, go basket. I see you. You lay like that for a week alone with your thoughts in the room, tethered, breathless, undefended. At sea is on an ice flow slipping down into the shipping lanes. The eye adjusts, even to darkness, even to the presence of what overwhelms us. And as I make my way from the bed to the study, the soles of my feet on the carpet warp it as any fabric made of this space time will distort beneath the force of a large object. And my father, as it happens, is gigantic. And if you thought an understanding could be reached, you were wrong, but it could not. The goldfish highlights the light of itself through a ten gallon darkness, and I keep watch as the large hand of the clock covers the small and leaves it behind to the weak approximation I sit here in and finish writing. I want the poem to destroy time. What are the ceremonies of forgetting? There is a spring in Boeotia that lets the river Letha enter our world. King Jackie's ale of forgetfulness, excessive flame. But I like the notion of the angel lightly tapping the baby in its soft hollow above the top lip, erasing all the child knows, all its grief, all its terrible regret, before it descends again fresh to the world. After your stroke, you were born once more, smaller, greyer, and softer, and after mum died, left bewildered. Drift, ordering crap online and following the auctions, the horses, the football, the golf, but hungering for company, for anyone, sending money to that Kenyan who was younger than me and flying out to Germany to see her, and again, before Jackie arrived on the scene, the bottle blonde who had her demons, of which she meant she was a violent alcoholic, although with Louise things seemed steady enough for a few months until you got stuck in one of your loops about her ex-husband funding her and changing plans with an ingrate daughter. You could never let anything go. A trait I also suffer from and kind of admire, but that is impossible here. The tick of the clock is melt water dripping into the fissure. The minute hand clicks across the hour hand and hovers for a minute, exactly. And impinging on the vision is your slack, wild face, the way a nurse's hand might hold your cold hand or try again to lift your hand, but your hand now will not respond. I've been writing elegies for you all my life, Father, in one form or another, but now I find the path is just this game trail through the forest, the forest of mine, which I must follow in the manner of an animal, a deer, a fox, a chimpanzee, Returning to the clearing to nuzzle the corpse, to lick its nape or bite it softly, to look away and look again and wait for a response. One hand on the clock holds the other for a minute before going on alone. It is death that is implicit in the ticking. One must negotiate the next moment. The mind will not stop and certain things are good to think with, goldfish, carpet, clock. I want something fit to mediate the procreative business of redoubling the little world and settle on an image for a second, since it is a given that the mind will keep returning to the magic, the le jeu de main, the trick, one hand holding your hand as it turns into an object, as I turn back along the track towards the front, towards the corner of the field where the father's body lies, and with an animal's dumb clarity, do grief work. Kiss your hand and kiss your cheek and leave my forehead for a time pressed against yours. When I phoned the hospital this afternoon to say goodbye, but you were no longer lucid, and as if the nurse held the phone against your ear and I could hear you breathing, or perhaps the rasping of the oxygen machine, and I said what you'd expect. I love you, Dad. 
I want you to keep on fighting. If you are too tired or in too much pain, then you should stop fighting and let go. And whatever happens, it's okay. I love you. You were a good father. The kids love you. Thank you for everything. And I hung up and seen. Impossible to grieve and not know the vanity of grief. To watch oneself perform the rituals that take us. Automaton of grief, I hired, of course, by myself in my office, then sobbed for a bit on the sofa. An elegy, I think, is words to bind the grief in, a companionship of grief, a spell to keep it safe and solid, to keep it from escaping. There are various ways to memorize. Plato calls a Nemo sign. My grandfather Bertie liked to tie a knot in his blue handkerchief. My father wrote in Biro on his palm. I cannot leave the poem alone. Do you remember the pure world? I remember it from being a kid. What was at stake in that place? One moved through it sideways, through forests of time, lost in them. It had to be called back to the moment. Infinities growing in stone, in moss, in the hay shed, the rain, the wind, in the darkness under the cattle roof. Wilka says of the pure and separated element, someone dies and is it. It's after two. You're dead by now, I hope. Who thought to write that? But there's no hurry now, no effort, no need to call. You might be only sitting in your red chair, endlessly flicking through the channels. When I asked the doctor, Andrew Black, he said, it could take minutes, it could take hours. And I see you slumped, your eyes shut, propped against some pillows, something in you finally given up to find gravity, some obedience to object who had settled in you now and set up home, set in stone. Outside of the motorway, the headlights of the vehicles and necklaces of diamonds, double strung, and trailing westwards alongside them, the necklaces of garments. Dad, I cannot stay in the room with you too long in my mind. It is too hard. I thought there would be futurity. I thought things would happen. Nothing major. Barbecues. Why barbecues? God knows. You were walking round Bantry at the Friday market in your shorts in the light rain. Your white tube socks pulled up and a bright t-shirt from some Spanish golf course tucked into your shorts. By the way, Dad, we are even. You and I. No need. Look. I absolutely still the rumours. Outside, the widowed sky has grown huge with stars. The Milky Way meandering like the Ballandary, but the night has come with work to do. It sits with you and breathes. I want you to come at your own pace. And in your next moment, you might get up and speak clearly to everything. Creation, extinction, extinction infinities rising within you. Alistair Laird is dead. Fuck me, fuck, fuck me, fuck, 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 my dad is dead. Bad luck. The light breaks, and the night breaks, and the line breaks, and the day is late assembling. Rows of terraced houses are clicking into place. Clouds decelerate and make like everything is normal. The children wanting porridge. Voices forcing a pattern out of circumstance. Pitching rhythmic incident on little grades of expectation, satisfaction. Disappointment, this new old. I'm walking to school, at the corner where the halfway house is, leaves animated in the briefest circle by the wind. Thank you. Thank you.